I have a reading today from Joel chapter 2, verses 21 to 27. Do not fear, O soil, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, you animals of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green, the tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and the vine give their full yield. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I, the Lord, am your God and there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Our second reading is from the sixth chapter of Matthew. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. <clears throat> but strive first for the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. The title of today's sermon is actually the King James translation of that last line. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I remember one time when I was a theological student and I was in a meeting with my supervisor after I had gotten into some mischief while serving the congregation. And he said to me, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And I'm spelling it D-A-Y-E. A sermon preached by Reverend Dr. Tavita Havea in the chapel of the Pacific Theological College in Fiji almost 20 years ago is still fresh in my mind. In the sermon, my colleague Tavita, who was from Tonga, talked about Tongans who lived generations ago on a small island off of the main island. They lived with a particular challenge. There was no source of fresh water on their little island. The only freshwater spring was actually a little offshore and they would go out with vessels to collect the sweet water from among the salt. Over the years, there were a number of occasions when the sweet water disappeared and their buckets could only find salt. As you can imagine, this caused much anxiety. What struck me most strongly about this story is how these ancestors responded to the disappearance of fresh water. They interpreted this calamity as a sign that they had somehow fallen out of favor with their God. That something about how they were living had placed them in disharmony with the spiritual order 
and this was being manifest in the natural order as an absence of fresh water. Instead of frantically trying to dig new wells under the water, their response was to come together as a community for a concerted time, a time of discernment, repentance, and reconciliation. As it happened, the sweet water returned, as did their sense of spiritual harmony manifested in the natural realm. Now, it's hard to imagine a setting more different from this little tropical haven than the set setting for today's reading from the prophet Joel. Joel writes to the ancient Israelites living on dusty hills and plains of Palestine. But Joel shares an important belief with those Pacific Islanders. Disaster in the physical world is a manifestation of disharmony with the spiritual order, with the divine. Israel has been punished by drought and by plagues of locusts. But through a process of punishment, repentance, and reharmonization, Israel has been vindicated. The rains have come, the locusts have disappeared, and the storehouses are full. Now, both of these narratives contain elements of anxiety, even existential threat, not to mention disturbing depictions of punitive gods. But there is something underlying the narratives that is comforting. The ancient Israelites and Tevita Hevea's forebears both looked deeply into their world and made the same conclusion. There is an underlying cosmic order. Despite the unpredictability of everyday events, despite the calamities and the vagaries of human experience, they could perceive an underlying harmony, an almost tectonic goodness, if you will, and they believed they had agency. When they act, acted in concert with this order, they were blessed, blessed with well-being and the fruits of the world. When they violated the spiritual harmony, there were consequences. And while they might fear those consequences, they were comforted by the belief that humans were not without agency. They were not subject to the chaotic expressions of a random universe or fickle gods who didn't care about their fate. This view of the world and our life in it has persisted for people of faith throughout the centuries. Jesus' words of comfort in Matthew 6, including his assurance, strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you, are grounded in this view, that there's an underlying cosmic harmony that's good. In today's world, however, it seems to be more and more difficult to maintain this perspective. First of all, the world view of cosmic materialism, which dominates Western culture, refutes it. Our dominant worldview says there may be natural laws, but the creation of life was a chance event. And there is no underlying moral order or spiritual realm that human beings can access to affect the events in our world. Our only agency lies in the application of technology. And this view seems to be reinforced by the chaotic results of the application of technology. The inventions that expand human agency, cars, airplanes, power plants, industrial agriculture, have heated up the planet, destabilized its systems, and ushered in calamities of biblical proportion. And those who study the evolution of human technologies predict that even more dramatic changes are coming even to the very nature of our species. I want to read an extended quote from the magisterial work Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari, well-known author of Sapiens. 
Harari discusses the enormously consequential advances in the areas of genetic engineering, cyborg engineering, building machines and computers into our bodies, and artificial intelligence. He goes on to say, we don't know where these paths might lead us, nor what our godlike descendants will look like. Foretelling the future was never easy, and revolutionary biotechnologies make it even harder. For as difficult as it is to predict the impact of new technologies in fields like transportation, communication, and energy, technologies for upgrading humans pose a completely different kind of challenge. Since they can transform, they can be used to transform human minds and desires, people possessing present day minds and desires by definition cannot fathom their implications. For thousands of years, history was full of technological, economic, social, and political upheavals. Yet one thing remained constant, humanity itself. Our tools and institutions are very different from those of biblical times, but the deep structures of the human mind remain the same. This is why we can still find ourselves between the pages of the Bible and the writings of Confucius or within the tragedies of Sophocles or Euripides. These classics were created by humans just like us, hence we feel they talk about us. However, once technology enables us to re-engineer human minds, homo sapiens will disappear. Human history will come to an end and a completely new kind of process will begin, which people like you and me cannot comprehend. Many scholars try to predict how the world will look in the year 2100 or 2200. This is a waste of time, end quote. Well, this is a lot to take in, but I think we can all agree on a couple of things. First, the world is changing with breathtaking speed and this change is making life more uncertain. Second, in times that seem more and more chaotic, it becomes hard to believe in an underlying order, let alone one marked by what the Buddhists call basic goodness. Fortunately, Jesus preaching in Matthew six speaks to just such time, to a time just like ours. His listeners, first century Jews living under the weight of the largest empire in history, which was ushering in change in every area of life, technological, cultural, political, spiritual, and imposing this change with great violence, Jews of the first century would have been reeling in uncertainty as much as we are in the 21st. So what was Jesus' instruction to them? Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life, but strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given unto you as well. Well, I think Jesus understood as well as any counselor that just saying to someone, don't worry, doesn't stop them from worrying. So what's he up to here? Jesus understood that the great temptation in times of chaos and danger is to be so captured by anxiety that we become hyper-concerned with ourselves. We become self-focused. We hoard our riches, we hoard our food, we hoard our money, and we become obsessed with security. When he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, he knows full well that we can't enter the kingdom as individuals. You remember the, his teachings? Where two or three are gathered in my name, that's where I will be. 
The kingdom lives within you and among you. Jesus is driving people into community and teaching them that the underlying order is manifest there in community. And by the way, it is disharmony within community that sends Tongans and Israelites and all of us out of sync with the underlying order. In community is trust. In community is generosity. In community is our daily bread because we share with each other. Living in the blessings of community ultimately gives rise to the single emotion that is the best antidote to worry. Gratitude. You can't will away worry, no matter who tells you to. But you can turn from worry to, to generosity in a way that builds community. And for that, you will ultimately be grateful. Today's reading ends with this instruction. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is sufficient for today, or sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Yes, life is changing at a pace that boggles the mind and twists the gut. It is tempting to believe that by worrying about tomorrow, by perseverating on its dangers, we can predict it and set our, ourselves up to be safe and comfortable then. But that just causes anxiety to rebound when tomorrow doesn't look like we thought it would. Let's shift our focus today. Let's live in generosity and gratitude in a way that builds community and draws community down into the underlying order that our tradition promises is actually there. In that order, in the kingdom, we will find strength and wisdom and courage and genius. And when tomorrow brings the evil of that day or just the chaos, we will have those things to draw on. We will need to analyze change, to develop strategic responses, to have excellent thinking. We will need to generate new technologies. I'm not trying to say spirituality and technology are at odds with each other. But the creative work of understanding change and developing new strategies and technologies will be driven by gratitude and hope not by anxiety and worry if today and every day we can let go of having to control tomorrow and focus our energies on being generous and growing community now. Worry is ingenious at causing us to be self-obsessed. Gratitude is ingenious at building right relations. And the genius and courage of those relations is the place from which we must operate to face what is coming. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody.